The Life of the Hasidim Written by Martin Buber From the Legend of the Baal Shem Read by Vincent Pagnol Hitler Havot The Burning The Ardour of Ecstasy A fiery sword guards the way to the Tree of Life. It scatters into sparks before the touch of Hitler Havut, whose light finger is more powerful than it. To Hitler Havut the path is open, and all bounds sink before its boundless step. The world is no longer its place. It is the place of the world. Hitler Havut unlocks the meaning of life. Without it, even heaven has no meaning and no being. If a man has fulfilled the whole of the teaching and all the commandments, but has not had the rapture and the burning, when he dies and passes beyond, paradise is opened to him. But because he has not felt rapture in the world, he also does not feel it in paradise. Hitler Havut can appear at all places and at all times. Each hour is its footstool, and each deed its throne. Nothing can stand against it. Nothing hold it down. Nothing can defend itself against its might, which raises everything corporal to spirit. He who is in it is in holiness. He can speak idle words with his mouth, Yet the teaching of the Lord is in his heart at this hour. He can pray and whisper, yet his heart cries out in his breast. He can sit in a community of men, yet he walks with God, mixing with the creatures, yet secluded from the world. Each thing and each deed is thus sanctified. When a man attaches himself to God, he can allow his mouth to speak what it may speak, and his ear to hear what it may hear, and he will bind the things to their higher root. Repetition, the power which weakens and discolors so much in human life, is powerless before ecstasy, which catches fire again and again from precisely the most regular, most uniform events. Ecstasy overcame one Zadok in reciting the scriptures. Each time that he reached the words, and God spoke. A Hasidic wise man who told this to his disciples added to it. But I think also, if one speaks in truth and one receives in truth, then one word is enough to uplift the whole world and to purge the whole world from sin. To the man in ecstasy, the habitual is eternally new. Azadik stood at the window in the early morning light and trembling cried, A few hours ago it was night, and now it is day. God brings up the day. And he was full of fear and trembling. He also said, Every creature should be ashamed before the Creator, were he perfect as he was destined to be, then he would be astonished and awakened and inflamed because of the renewal of the creature at each time and in each moment. But Hitler Havot is not a sudden sinking into eternity. It is an ascent to the infinite from rung to rung. To find God means to find the way without end. The Hasidim saw the world to come in the image of this way. And they never called that world a beyond. One of the pious saw a dead master in a dream. The latter told him that from the hour of his death, he went each day from world to world. And the world which yesterday was stretched out above his gaze at heaven is today the earth under his foot. And the heaven of today is the earth of tomorrow. And each world is purer and more beautiful and more profound than the one before. The angels rest in God, but the Holy Spirits go forward in God. The angel is one who stands 
and the holy man is one who travels on. Therefore the holy man is higher than the angel. Such is the way of ecstasy. If it appears to offer an end, an arriving, an attaining, an acquiring, it is only a final no, not a final yes. It is the end of constraint, the shaking off of the last chains, the liberation which is lifted above everything earthly. When man moves from strength to strength and ever upward and upward until he comes to the root of all teaching and all command, to the eye of God, the simple unity and boundlessness, when he stands there, then all the wings of command and law sink down and are as if destroyed. For the evil impulse is destroyed since he stands above it. Above nature and above time and above thought, thus is he called who is in ecstasy. He has cast off all sorrow and all that is oppressive. Sweet suffering, I receive you in love, said a dying Zadok. And Rabbi Sozia cried out amazed when his hand slipped out of the fire in which he had placed it. How coarse Susia's body has become that it is afraid of fire. A man of ecstasy rules life. And no external happening that penetrates into his realm can disturb his inspiration. It is told of Azadik that when the holy meal of the teaching prolonged itself till morning, he said to his disciples, We have not stepped into the limits of the day, rather the day, has stepped into our limits, and we need not give way before it. In ecstasy, all that is past and that is future draws near to the present. Time shrinks. The line between the eternities disappears. Only the moment lives, and the moment is eternity. In its undivided light appears all that was and all that will be, simple and composed. It is there as a heartbeat is there and becomes perceptible like it. The Hasidic legend has much to tell of those wonderful ones who remember their earlier forms of existence, who were aware of the future as of their own breath, who saw from one end of the earth to the other and felt all the changes that took place in the world as something that happened to their own bodies. All this is not yet that state in which Hitler Havot has overcome the world of space and time, we can perhaps learn something of this latter state from two simple anecdotes which supplement each other. It is told of one master that he had to look at a clock during the hour of withdrawal in order to keep himself in this world, and of another that when he wished to observe individual things, he had to put on spectacles in order to restrain his spiritual vision for otherwise he saw all the individual things of the world as one. But the highest rung which is reported is that in which the withdrawn one transcends his own ecstasy. When a disciple once remarked that a Zadok had grown cold and censored him for it, he was instructed by another. There is a very high holiness. If one enters it, one becomes detached from all being, and can no longer become inflamed. Thus ecstasy completes itself in its own suspension. At times, it expresses itself in an action, consecrates it, and fills it with holy meaning. The purest form, that in which the whole body serves the aroused soul, and in which each of the soul's risings and bendings creates a visible symbol corresponding to it, allowing one image of enraptured meaning to emerge out of a thousand waves of movement, is the dance. It is told of the dancing of one Zadok. His foot was as light as that of a four-year-old child, and among all who saw his holy dancing, there was not one in whom the holy turning was not accomplished. For in the hearts of all who saw, he worked both weeping and rapture in one. 
or the soul lays hold of the voice of a man and makes it sing what the soul has experienced in the heights, and the voice does not know what it does. Thus one Zadok stood in prayer in the day of awe, New Year and the Day of Atonement, and sang new melodies, wonder of wonder, that he had never heard and that no human ear had ever heard, and he did not know at all what he sang and in what way he sang, for he was bound to the upper world. But the truest life of the man of ecstasy is not among men. It is said of one master that he behaved like a stranger. According to the words of David the king, a sojourner am I in the land. Like a man who comes from afar from the city of his birth, he does not think of honors, nor of anything for its own welfare. He only thinks about returning home to the city of his birth. He can possess nothing, for he knows that is alien, and I must go home. Many walk in solitude, in the wandering. Rabbi Susio used to stride about in the woods and sing songs of praise with so great ardour that one would almost say that he was out of his mind. Another was only to be found in the streets and gardens and groves. When his father-in-law reproved him for this, he answered with the parable of the hen who hatched out goose eggs. And when she saw her children swimming about on the surface of the water, she ran up and down in consternation, seeking help for the unfortunate ones, and did not understand that this was their whole life to them, to roam on the surface of the water. There are still more profoundly solitary ones whose Hitler havot for all that is not yet fulfilled. They become unsettled and fugitive. They go into exile in order to suffer exile with the Shekinah. It is one of the basic conceptions of the Kabbalah that the Shekinah, the indwelling presence of God, endlessly wanders in exile, separated from her Lord, and that she will be reunited with him only in the hour of redemption. So these men of ecstasy wander over the earth, dwelling in the silent distances of God's exile, companions of the universal and holy happening of existence. The man who is detached in this way is the friend of God, as a stranger is the friend of another stranger on account of their strangeness on earth. There are moments in which he sees the Shekinah face to face in human form. As that Zadok saw it in the Holy Land, in the shape of a woman who weeps and laments over the husband of her youth, but not only in faces out of the dark and in the silence of wandering does God give himself to the soul of fire with him. Rather, out of all the things of the earth, his eye looks into the eye of him who seeks, and every being is the fruit in which he offers himself to the yearning soul. Being is unveiled in the hand of the holy man, the soul of him who longs very much for a woman and regards her many-colored garment is not turned to its gorgeous material and its colors, but to the splendor of the longed-for woman who is clothed in it. But the others see only the garment and no more. So he who in truth longs for and embraces God sees in all the things of the world only the strength and the pride of the Creator who lives in the things. But he who is not on this rung sees the things as separate from God. This is the earthly life of Hitler Havut, which soars beyond all limits. It enlarges the soul to the all. It narrows the all down to nothing. A Hasidic master speaks of it in words of mystery. The creation of heaven and of earth is the unfolding of something out of nothing, the descent of the higher into the lower. But the holy men who detach themselves from being 
and ever cleave to God, see and comprehend Him in truth, as if there was now the nothing as before creation. They turn the something back into nothing. And this is the more wonderful, to raise up what is beneath. As it is written in the Gemara, the last wonder is greater than the first. Avoda service. Hitler Havut is embracing God beyond time and space. Avoda is the service of God in time and space. Hitler Havut is the mystic meal. Avoda is the mystic offering. These are the poles between which the life of the holy man swings. Hitler Havut is silent since it lies on the heart of God. A voter speaks, What am I and what is my life that I wish to offer you my blood and my fire? Hitler Habud is as far from a voter as fulfillment is from longing. And yet Hitler Habud streams out of a voter as the finding of God from the seeking of God. A king once built a great and glorious palace with numberless chambers, but only one door was opened. When the building was finished, it was announced that all princes should appear before the king who sat enthroned in the last of the chambers. But when they entered, they saw that there were doors open on all sides, which led to winding passages in the distance. And there were again doors and again passages, and no end arose before the bewildered eyes. Then came the king's son, and saw that all the labyrinth was a mirrored illusion. And he saw his father sitting in the hall before him. The mystery of grace cannot be interpreted. Between seeking and finding lies the tension of a human life. Indeed, the thousandfold return of the anxious, wandering soul. And yet the flight of a moment is slower than the fulfillment, for God wishes to be sought. And how could he not wish to be found? When the holy man brings ever new fire, that the glowing embers on the altar of his soul may not be extinguished, God himself says the sacrificial speech. God rules man as he ruled chaos at the time of the infancy of the world, and as when the world began to unfold, and he saw that if it flowed further asunder, it would no longer be able to return home to its roots, then he spoke, Enough! So it is that when the soul of man in its suffering rushes headlong, without direction, and evil becomes so mighty in it that it soon could no longer return home, then his compassion awakens and he says, Enough! But man too can say enough to the multiplicity within him. When he collects himself and becomes one, he draws near to the oneness of of God. He serves his Lord. This is Avoda. It was said of one Zadok, with him, teaching and prayer and eating and sleeping are all one, and he can raise the soul to its root. All action bound in one, and the infinite life enclosed in every action. This is a voda. In all the deeds of man, speaking and looking and listening and going and remaining standing and lying down, the boundless is clothed. 
From every deed an angel is born, a good angel or a bad one, but from half-hearted and confused deeds, which are without meaning or without power, angels are born with twisted limbs or without a head or hands or feet. When the rays of the universal sun radiate and the light concentrates in every deed, this is service. But no special act is elected for this service. God wills that one serve him in all ways. There are two kinds of love. The love of a man for his wife, which ought properly to express itself in secret and not where spectators are. For this love can only fulfill itself in a place secluded from the creatures, and the love for brothers and sisters and for children, which needs no concealment. Similarly, there are two kinds of love for God, the love through the teaching and prayer and the fulfillment of the commandments. This love ought properly to be consummated in silence, not in public, in order that it may not tempt one to glory and pride, and the love in the time in which one mixes with the creatures, when one speaks and hears, gives and takes with them, and yet in the secret of one's heart, one cleaves to God and does not cease to think of him. And this is a higher rung than that. And of it it is said, O oh, that thou wert as my brother that sucked on the breasts of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee, yea, and none would despise me. This is not to be understood, however, as if there were in this kind of service a cleavage between the earthly and the heavenly deed. Rather, each motion of the surrendered soul is a vessel of holiness and of power. It is told of one Zadok that he had so sanctified all his limbs that each step of his feet wed worlds to one another. Man is a ladder placed on earth and touching heaven with its head, and all his gestures and affairs and speaking leave traces in the higher world. Here the inner meaning of Avoda is intimated, coming from the depths of the old Jewish secret teaching and illuminating the mystery of that duality of ecstasy and service, of having and seeking. God has fallen into duality through the created world and its deed, into the being of God, Elohim, which is withdrawn from the creatures and the presence of God, the Shekinah, which dwells in things, wandering, straying, scattered. Only redemption will reunite the two in eternity, but it is given to the human spirit through its service to be able to bring the Shekinah near to its source, to help it to enter it, and in this moment of homecoming, before it must again descend into the being of things, the whirlpool which rushes through life of the stars becomes silent. The torches of the great devastation are extinguished. The whip in the hand of fate drops down. The world pain pauses and listens. The grace of graces has appeared. Blessing pours down out of infinity until the power of entanglement begins to drag down the Shekinah and all becomes as before. That is the meaning of service. Only the prayer that takes place for the sake of the Shekinah truly lives. Through his need and his want, he knows the want of the Shekinah, and he prays that the want of the Shekinah will be satisfied, and that through him, the praying man, the unification of God with his Shekinah will take place. Man should know that his suffering comes from the suffering of the Shekinah. He is one of her limbs, and the stilling of her need is the only true stilling of his he does not think about the satisfaction of his needs, neither the lower nor the higher ones, that he might not be like him who cuts off the eternal plants and causes separation. Rather, he does all for the sake of the want of the Shekinah, and all will be resolved of itself, and his own suffering too will be stilled out of the stilling of the higher roots, for all above and below is one unity. I am prayer speaks the Shekinah. A Zadok said, Men think they pray before God, but it is not so. For prayer itself is divinity. In the narrow room of self, no prayer can thrive. 
He who prays in suffering because of the melancholy which masters him and thinks that he prays in fear of God or he prays in joy because of the brightness of his mood and thinks he prays in love of God, his prayer is nothing at all. For this fear is only melancholy and this love is only empty joy. It is told that the Baal Shem once remained standing on the threshold of a house of prayer and did not want to enter. He spoke in aversion. I cannot enter there. The house is full to the brim of teaching and prayer. And when his companions were astonished because it appeared to them that there could be no greater praise than this, he explained to them, During the day the people speak here words without true devotion, without love and compassion, words that have no wings. They remain between the walls, they squat on the floor, they grow layer by layer like decaying leaves until the decay has packed the house to overflowing and there is no longer room for me in there. Prayer may be held down in two different ways. If it is spoken without inner intention, and if the earlier deeds of the praying man lie spread out like a heavy cloud between him and heaven, the obstacle can only be overcome if the man grows upward into the sphere of ecstasy and purifies himself in its grace, or if another soul who is in ecstasy sets the fettered prayers free and carries them upward along with his own. Thus it is told of one Zadok that he stood for a long time silent and without movement during communal prayer and only then began himself to pray. Just as the tribe of Dan lay at the end of the camp and gathered all that was lost, his word became a garment to whose folds the prayers that were held below would cling and be borne upward. This Zadok used to say of prayer, I bind myself with the whole of Israel, with those who are greater than I, that through them my thoughts may ascend, and with those who are lesser than I, that they may be uplifted through me. But this is the mystery of community. Not only do the lower need the higher, but the higher also need the lower. Here lies another distinction between the state of ecstasy and the state of service. Hitler Havut is the individual way and goal. A rope is stretched over the abyss, tied to two slender trees, shaken by the storm. It is tread in solitude and dread by the foot of the venturer. Here there is no human community, neither in doubt nor in attainment. Service, however, is open to many souls in union. The souls bind themselves to one another for greater unity and might. There is a service that only the community can fulfill. The Baal Shem told a parable. Some men stood under a very high tree. And one of the men had eyes to see. He saw that in the top of the tree stood a bird, glorious with genuine beauty, but the others did not see it. And a great longing came over the man to reach the bird and take it, and he could not go from there without the bird. But because of the height of the tree, this was not in his power, and a ladder was not to be had. But because his longing was so overpowering, he found a way. He took the men who stood around him and placed them on top of one another, each on the shoulder of a comrade. He, however, climbed to the top so that he reached the bird and took it. And although the men had helped him, they knew nothing of the bird and did not see it. But he, who knew it and saw it, would not have been able to reach it without them. If, moreover, the lowest of them had left his place, then those above would have fallen to the earth. And the temple of the Messiah is called the bird's nest in the book Zohar. But it is not as if only the Zadok's prayer is received by God, or as if only this prayer is lovely in his eyes. No prayer is stronger in grace and penetrates in more direct flight through all the worlds of heaven than that of the simple man who does not know anything to say and only knows to offer God 
the unbroken promptings of his heart. God receives them as a king receives the singing of a nightingale in his gardens at twilight. A singing that sounds sweeter to him than the homage of the princes in his throne room. The Hasidic legend cannot give enough examples of the favor that shines on the undivided person and of the power of his service. One of these we shall set down here. A villager who year after year attended the prayer house of the Baal Shem in the days of awe had a boy who was dull in understanding and could not even learn the shape of the letters, let alone understand the holy words. The father did not take him to the city on the days of awe, for he knew nothing. And still, when he was thirteen years old and of age to receive God's law, the father took him with him on the day of atonement, that he might not eat something on the day of penance through lack of knowledge and understanding. Now, the boy had a little whistle on which he always whistled during the time when he sat in a field and pastured the sheep and calves. He had brought it with him in his pocket without the father's knowing it. The boy sat in the prayer house during the holy hours and did not know anything to say, but when the Musaf prayer was begun, he spoke to his father. Father, I have my whistle with me, and I wish to play on it. Then the father was very disturbed and commanded him, Take care that you do not do so. And he had to hold himself in. But when the Mincha prayer came, he spoke again, Father, allow me now to take my whistle. When the father saw that his soul desired to whistle, he became angry and asked him, Where do you keep it? And when the boy showed him the place, he laid his hand on the pocket and held it over it to guard the whistle. But the Naila prayer began, and the lights burned, trembling in the evening, and the hearts burned like the lights, inexhausted by the long waiting, and through the house the eighteen benedictions strode once again, weary but erect, and the great confession returned for the last time, and before the evening descended and God judged, lay yet once more before the ark of the Lord, its forehead on the floor and its hands extended. Then the boy could no longer suppress his ecstasy. He tore the whistle from his pocket and let its voice powerfully resound. All stood startled and bewildered. But the Baal Shem raised himself above them and spoke, the judgment is suspended, and wrath is dispelled from the face of the earth. Thus every service which proceeds from a simple or a unified soul is sufficient and complete. But there is a still higher one, for he who has ascended from Avoda to Hitlahavud and has submerged his will in it, and receives his deed from it alone, has risen above every separate service. Each tzaddik has his special way of serving, but when the tzaddikim contemplate their root and attain to the nothing, then they can serve God on all rungs. Thus one of them said, I stand before God as a messenger boy, for he had attained to completion and to the nothing, so that he no longer possessed any special way. Rather, he stood ready for all ways which God might show him, as a messenger boy stands ready for all that his master will command him. He who thus serves in perfection has conquered the primeval duality and has brought Hitlahavut, into the heart of Avoda. He dwells in the kingdom of life, and yet all walls have fallen. All boundary stones are uprooted. All separation is destroyed. He is the brother of the creatures and feels their glance as if it were his own. Their step as if, their step as if his own feet walked. 
their blood as if it flowed through his own body. He is the Son of God and lays his soul anxiously and securely in the great hand beside all the heavens and earths and unknown worlds and stands on the flood of the sea into which all his thoughts and the wanderings of all beings flow. He makes his body the throne of life and life the throne of the spirit and the spirit the throne of the soul, and the soul the throne of the light of God's glory, and the light streams round about him, and he sits in the midst of the light, and trembles, and rejoices. Kavana, Intention Kavana is the mystery of a soul directed to a goal. Kavana is not will. It does not think of transplanting an image into the world of actual things, of making fast a dream as an object so that it may be at hand to be experienced at one's convenience in satiating recurrence. Nor does it desire to throw the stone of action into the well of happening that its waters may, for a while, become troubled and astonished, only to return then to the deep command of their existence, nor to lay a spark on the fuse that runs through the succession of the generations, that a flame may jump from age to age until it is extinguished in one of them without sign or leave-taking. Not this is Kavana's meaning, that the horses pulling the great wagon should feel one impulse more, or that one building more should be erected beneath the overfull gaze of the stars. Kavana does not mean purpose, but goal. But there are no goals, only the goal. There is only one goal that does not lie, that becomes entangled in no new way, only one into which all ways flow, before which no byway can forever flee. Redemption. Kavana is a ray of God's glory that dwells in each man and means redemption. This is redemption, that the Shekinah shall return home from its exile, that all shells may withdraw from the Shekinah, and that it may purify itself and unite itself with its owner in perfect unity. As a sign of this, the Messiah will appear and make all beings free. To many a Hasid, it is, for the whole of his life, as if this must happen here and now. For he hears the voices of becoming roaring in the gorges, and feels the seed of eternity in the ground of time, as if it were in his blood. And so he can never think otherwise than that this moment, and now this one, will be the chosen moment, and his imagination compels him ever more fervently, for ever more commandingly speaks the voice, and ever more demandingly swells the seed. It is told of one Zadok that he awaited redemption with such eagerness that when he heard a tumult in the street, he was at once moved to ask what it was and whether the messenger had not come, and each time that he went to sleep, he commanded his servant to awaken him at the very moment when the messenger came. For the coming of the Redeemer was so deeply implanted in his heart 
that it was as when a father awaits his only son from a distant land and stands on the watchtower with longing in his eyes and peers through all the windows, and when one opens the door, hurries out to see whether his son has not come. Others, however, are aware of the progress of the stride, and see the place and hour of the path, and know the distance of the coming one. Each thing shows them the uncompleted state of the world. The need of existence speaks to them, and the breath of the winds bears bitterness to them. The world in their eyes is like an unripe fruit. Inwardly they partake in the glory, then they look outward. All lies in battle. When the great Zadok, Rabbi Menahem, was in Jerusalem, it happened that a foolish man climbed the Mount of Olives and blew the shofar trumpet. No one had seen him. A rumor spread among the people that this was the shofar blast which announced the redemption. When this came to the ears of the rabbi, he opened a window and looked out into the air of the world. And he said at once, Here is no renewal. This is the way of redemption, that all souls and all sparks of souls, which have sprung from the primeval soul and have sunk and become scattered in all creatures at the time of the original darkening of the world or through the guilt of the ages, should conclude their wandering and return home purified. The Hasidim speak of this in the parable of the prince who allows the meal to begin only when the last of the guests has entered. All men are the abode of wandering souls. These dwell in many creatures and strive from form to form toward perfection. But those which are not able to purify themselves are caught in the world of confusion and make their homes in lakes of water, in stones, in plants, in animals, awaiting the redeeming hour. It is not only souls that are everywhere imprisoned, but also sparks of souls. No thing is without them. They live in all that is. Each form is their prison. And this is the meaning and mission of Kavana, that it is given to men to lift up the fallen and to free the imprisoned. Not only to wait, not only to watch for the coming one. Man can work toward the redemption of the world. Just that is Kavana, the mystery of the soul that is directed to redeem the world. It is told of some holy men that they imagined that they might bring about redemption by storm and force. In this world, when they were so afire with the grace of ecstasy that to them, who had even embraced God, nothing appeared unattainable any longer. Or in the coming world, a dying Zadik said, My friends have gone hence, intending to bring the Messiah, and have forgotten to do so in their rapture. But I shall not forget. A dying Zadok said, In reality, however, each can only be effective in his domain. Each man has a sphere of being in space and time which is allotted to him to be redeemed through him. Places which are heavy with unraised sparks and in which souls are fettered Wait for the man who will come to them with the word of freedom. When a Hasid cannot pray in one place and goes to another, 
Then the first place demands of him, Why would you not speak the holy words over me? And if there is evil in me, then it is for you to redeem me. But also all journeys have secret destinations of which the traveler is unaware. It was said of some Zadikim that they had a helping power over the wandering souls at all times, but especially when they stood in prayer. The wanderers of eternity appeared imploring before them, wishing to receive salvation from their hands. But they also knew how to find the voiceless among the banished, in the exile of a tired body, or in the darkness of the elements, and to upraise them. This help is an awesome venture set down in the midst of threatening dangers, which only the holy man can enter upon without going under. He who has a soul may let himself down into the chasm, bound fast to the rim, above through his thoughts as through a strong rope, and will return. He who has not yet attained the rung of thought, for him the bond will not hold, and he will fall into the depths. But if it is only those blessed ones who can plunge tranquilly into the darkness in order to aid a soul which is abandoned to the whirlpool of wandering, it is not denied to even the least of persons to raise the lost sparks from their imprisonment and send them home. The sparks are to be found everywhere. They are suspended in things as in sealed-off springs. They stoop in the creatures as in walled-up caves. They inhale darkness and they exhale dread. They wait. And those that dwell in space flit hither and thither around the movements of the world like light-mad butterflies, looking to see which of them they might enter in order to be redeemed through them. They all wait expectantly for freedom. The spark in a stone or a plant or another creature is like a complete figure which sits in the middle of the thing as in a block so that its hands and feet cannot stretch themselves and the head lies on the knees. He who is able to lift the holy spark leads this figure into freedom and no setting free of captives is greater than this. It is as when a king's son is rescued from captivity and brought to his father. But the liberation does not take place through formulae of exorcism or through any kind of prescribed and special action. All this grows out of the ground of otherness, which is not the ground of Kavana. No leap from the everyday into the miraculous is required. With every action, man can work on the figure of the Shekinah that it may step forth out of its concealment. It is not the matter of the action, but only as dedication that is decisive. Just that which you do in the uniformity of recurrence, or in the disposition of events, just this answer of the acting person to the manifold demands of the hour, an answer acquired through practice or one through inspiration, just this continuity of the living stream leads, when accomplished in dedication, to redemption. He who prays and sings in holiness, eats and speaks in holiness, in holiness takes the prescribed ritual bath, and in holiness is mindful of his business. Through him, the fallen sparks are raised and the fallen worlds redeemed and renewed. 
around each man, enclosed within the wide sphere of his activity, is laid a natural circle of things which, before all, he is called to set free. These are the creatures and objects that are spoken of as the possessions of this individual, his animals and his walls, his garden and his meadow, his tools and his food. Insofar as he cultivates and enjoys them in holiness, he frees their souls. For this reason, a man must always be compassionate toward his tools and all his possessions. But also in the soul itself, there appear those that need liberation. Most of these are sparks which have fallen through the guilt of this soul in one of its earlier lives. They are the alien, disturbing thoughts that often come to man in prayer. When man stands in prayer and desires to join himself to eternity, and the alien thoughts come and descend on him, these are holy sparks that have sunken and that wish to be raised and redeemed by him. And the sparks belong to him. They are kindred to the roots of his soul. It is as his own powers that he must redeem. He redeems them when he restores each troubled thought to its pure source, allows each impulse intent on a particular thing to flow into the divine creative impulse, allows everything alien to be submerged in the inalienable divine. This is the kavana of receiving that one Redeem the sparks in the surrounding things and the sparks that draw near out of the invisible. But there is yet another kavana, the kavana of giving. It bears no stray soul rays in helpful hands. It binds worlds to one another and rules over the mysteries. It pours itself into the thirsty distance. It gives itself to infinity. But it, too, has no need of miraculous deeds. Its path is creation, and the world before all other forms of creation. From time, immemorial speech was for the Jewish mystic, a rare and awe-inspiring thing. A characteristic theory of letters existed which dealt with them as with the elements of the world and with their intermixture as with the inwardness of reality. The word is an abyss through which the speaker strides. One should speak words as if the heavens were opened in them and as if it were not so that you take the word in your mouth, but rather as if you entered into the word. He who knows the secret melody that bears the inner and the outer, who knows the holy song that merges the lonely, shy letters into the singing of the spheres, he is full of the power of God, and it is as if he created heaven and earth and all worlds anew. He does not find his sphere before him, as does the freer of souls. He extends it from the firmament to the silent depths. But he also works toward redemption, for in each sign are the three, world, soul, and divinity. They rise and join and unite themselves, and they become the word, and the words unite themselves in God in genuine unity, since a man has set his soul in them. And worlds unite themselves and ascend, and the great rapture is born. Thus the acting person prepares the final oneness of all things. And as a voda flowed into the Hitler Havut, the basic principle of Hasidic life, so here too Kavana flows into Hitler Havut. For creating means to be created. The divine moves and overcomes us, and to be created is ecstasy. Only he who sinks into the nothing of the unconditioned 
receives the forming hand of the Spirit. This is portrayed in parable. It is not given to anything in the world to be reborn and to attain to a new form unless it comes first to the nothing, that is, to the form of the in-between. No creature can exist in it. It is the power before creation and is called chaos. Thus the perishing of the egg into the chick, and thus the seed, which does not sprout before it has gone down into the earth and decayed, and this is called wisdom, that is, a thought without revelation. And so it is, if man desires that a new creation come out of him, then he must come with all his potentiality to the state of nothing. And then God brings forth in him a new creation. And he is like a fountain that does not run dry and a stream that does not become exhausted. Thus the will of the Hasidic teaching of Kavana is twofold. That enjoyment, the internalizing of that which is without, should take place in holiness, and that creation, the externalizing of that which is within, should take place in holiness. Through holy creation and through holy enjoyment, the redemption of the world is accomplished. Shiflat, humility. God never does the same thing twice, said Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav. That which exists is unique, and it happens but once. New and without a past, it emerges from the flood of returnings, takes place, and plunges back into it unrepeatable. Each thing reaffirms at another time, but each transformed. And the throes and falls that rule over the great world creations, and the water and fire which shape the form of the earth, and the mixings and unmixings which brew the life of the living, and the spirit of man, with all its trial and error relation to the yielding abundance of the possible, All of these together cannot create an identical thing, nor bring back one of the things that have been sealed as belonging to the past. It is because things happen but once that the individual partakes in eternity. For the individual, with his inextinguishable uniqueness, is engraved in the heart of the all and lies forever in the lap of the timeless as he who is constituted thus and not otherwise. Uniqueness is the essential good of man that is given to him to unfold. And just this is the meaning of the return, that his uniqueness may become ever purer and more complete and that in each new life the one who has returned may stand in ever more untroubled and undisturbed incomparability. For pure uniqueness and pure perfection are one. And he who has become so entirely individual that no otherness any longer has power over him or place in him has completed the journey and is redeemed and rests in God. Every man shall know and consider that in his qualities he is unique in the world and that none like him ever lived. For had there ever before been someone like him, 
then he would not have needed to exist. But each is in truth a new thing in the world, and he shall make perfect his special quality. For it is because it is not perfect that the coming of the Messiah tarries. Only in his own way, and not in any other, can the one who strives perfect himself. He who lay hold of the rung of his companion, and lets go of his own rung, through him neither the one nor the other will be realized. Many acted like Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai, and in their minds it did not turn out well, for they were not of the same nature as he, but only acted as they saw him act, out of his nature. But as man seeks God in lonely fervor, and yet there is a high service that only the community can fulfill, and as man accomplishes enormous things with his everyday actions, yet does not do so alone, but needs for such action the world and the things in it. So the uniqueness of man proves itself in his life with others, For the more unique a man really is, so much the more can he give to the other, and so much the more will he give him. And this is his one sorrow, that his giving is limited by the one who takes. For the bestower is on the side of mercy, and the receiver is on the side of of rigor. And so it is with each thing, as when one pours out of a large vessel into a goblet. The vessel pours from out of its fullness, but the goblet limits the gift. The individual sees God and embraces him. The individual redeems the fallen worlds. And yet the individual is not a whole, but a part. And the purer and more perfect he is, so much the more intimately does he know that he is a part, and so much the more actively there stirs in him the community of existence. That is the mystery of humility. Every man has a light over him, and when the souls of two men meet, the two lights join each other, and from them there goes forth one light, and this is called generation. To feel the universal generation as a sea and oneself as a wave, that is the mystery of humility. But it is not humility when one lowers himself too much and forgets that man can bring down an overflowing blessing on all the world through his words and his actions. This is called impure humility. The greatest evil is when you forget that you are the son of a king. He is truly humble who feels the other as himself and himself in the other. Haughtiness means to contrast oneself with others. The haughty man is not he who knows himself, but he who compares himself with others. No man can presume too much if he stands on his own ground, since all the heavens are open to him and all the worlds devoted to him. The man who presumes too much is the man who contrasts himself with others, who sees himself as higher than the humblest of things, who rules with measure and waits and pronounces judgment. If Messiah should come today, a Zedek said, and say, you are better than the others, then I would say to him, you are not Messiah. The soul of the haughty lives without product and essence. It flutters and toils and is not blessed. The thoughts whose real intent is not what is thought, but themselves and their brilliance are shadows. The deed which has in mind not the goal, but dominance, has no body, only surface, no existence, only appearance. He who measures and weighs becomes empty and unreal, like measure and weight. In him who is full of himself, there is no room for God. It is told of one disciple that he went into seclusion and cut himself off from the things of the world in order to cling solely to the teaching and the service. And he sat alone fasting from Sabbath to Sabbath and learning and praying. But his mind, beyond all conscious purpose, was filled with pride in his action. 
It shone before his eyes, and his fingers burned to lay it on his forehead like the diadem of the anointed. And so all his work fell to the lot of the other side, and the divine had no share in it. But his heart drove him ever more strongly, so that he did not perceive his sinking, while the demons already played with his acts, and he imagined himself wholly possessed by God. Then it happened once that he leaned outside of himself and became aware of the mute and alienated things around him. Then understanding gripped him and he beheld his deeds piled up at the feet of a gigantic idol and he beheld himself in the reeling emptiness, abandoned to the nameless. This much is told and nothing more. But the humble man has the drawing power. As long as a man sees himself above and before others, he has a limit, and God cannot pour his holiness into him, for God is without limit. But when a man rests in himself as in the nothing, he is not limited by any other thing. He is limitless, and God pours his glory into him. The humility which is meant here is no willed and practiced virtue. It is nothing but an inner being, feeling and expressing. Nowhere in it is there a compulsion. Nowhere is self-humbling, a self-restraining, a self-resolve. It is indivisible as the glance of a child and simple as a child's speech. The humble man lives in each being and knows each being's manner and virtue. Since no one is to him the other, he knows from within that none lacks some hidden value, knows that there is no man who does not have his hour. For him the colors of the world do not blend with one another. Rather, each soul stands before him in the majesty of its particular existence. In each man, there is a priceless treasure that is in no other. Therefore, one shall honor each man for the hidden value that only he and none of his comrades has. God does not look on the evil side. How should I dare to do so? He who lives in others according to the mystery of humility can condemn no one. He who passes sentence on a man has passed it on himself. He who separates himself from the sinner departs in guilt, but the saint can suffer for the sins of a man as for his own. Living with the other as a form of knowing is justice, Living with the other as a form of being is love. For that feeling that is called love among men, the feeling of being near and of wishing to be near a few, is nothing other than a recollection from a heavenly life, those who sat next to one another in paradise and were neighbors and relatives, they are also near to one another in this world. But in truth, love is all comprehensive and sustaining and is extended to all the living without selection and distinction. How can you say of me that I am a leader of the generation, said Azadik, when I still feel in myself a stronger love for those near me and for my seed than for all men? That this attitude also extends to animals is shown by the accounts of Rabbi Wolf, who could never shout at a horse, of Rabbi Moshilib, who gave drink to the neglected calves at the market, of Rabbi Susia, who could not see a cage, and the wretchedness of the bird, and its anxiety to fly in the air of the world, and to be a free wanderer in accordance with its nature, without opening it. But it is not only the beings to whom the short-sighted gaze of the crowd accords the name of living, who are embraced by the love of the loving man. There is no thing in the world in which there is not life and each has received from his life the form in which it stands before your eyes. And lo, this life is the life of God. 
Thus it is held that the love of the living is love of God, and it is higher than any other service. A master asked one of his disciples, You know that two forces cannot occupy the human mind at the same time. If then you rise from your couch tomorrow, and two ways are before you, the love of God and the love of man, which should come first? I do not know, the latter answered. Then spoke the master. It is written in the prayer book. That is in the hands of the people. Before you pray, say the words, Love thy companion as one like thyself. Do you think that the venerable ones commanded that without purpose? If someone says to you that he has love for God, but has no love for the living, he speaks falsely and pretends that which is impossible. Therefore, when one has departed from God, the love of a man is his only salvation. When a father complained to the Baal Shem, My son is estranged from God. What shall I do? He replied, Love him more. This is one of the primary Hasidic words, to love more. Its roots sink deep and stretch out far. He who has understood this can learn to understand Judaism anew. There is a great moving force therein, a great moving force, and yet again only a lost sound. It is a lost sound when somewhere in that dark windowless room and at some time in those days without the power of message, the lips of a nameless, soon-to-be-forgotten man of the Zadik Rabbi Raphael form these words, if a man sees that his companion hates him, he shall love him the more. For the community of the living is the carriage of God's majesty. And where there is a rent in the carriage, one must fill it. And where there is so little love that the joining comes apart, one must love more on one's own side to overcome the lack. Once before a journey, this Rabbi Raphael called to a disciple that he should sit beside him in the carriage. I fear I shall make it too crowded for you, the latter responded. But the rabbi now spoke in an exalted voice. So we shall love each other more. Then there will be room enough for us. They may stand here as a witness, the symbol and the reality, separate and yet one and inseparable the carriage of the Shekinah and the carriage of the friends. Love lives in a kingdom greater than the kingdom of the individual and speaks out of a knowing deeper than the knowing of the individual. It exists in reality between the creatures, that is, it exists in God. Life covered and guaranteed by life, life pouring itself into life, thus first do you behold the soul of the world. What the one is wanting, the other makes up for. If one loves too little, the other will love more. Things help one another, but helping means to do what one does for its own sake and with a collected will. As he who loves more does not preach love to the other, but himself loves, and in a certain sense does not concern himself about the other, so the helping man in a certain sense does not concern himself about the other but does what he does out of himself with the thought of helping. That means that the essential thing that takes place between beings does not take place through their intercourse, but through the seemingly isolated, seemingly unconcerned, seemingly unconnected action that each of them performs. This is said in parable. If a man sings and cannot lift his voice, and another comes to help him and begins to sing, then this one too can now lift his voice. And that is the secret of co-operation. To help one another is no task, but a matter of course. The reality on which the life together of the Hasidim is founded. Help is no virtue, but an artery of existence. That is the new meaning of the old Jewish saying that good deeds save one from death. It is commanded that the helping person not think about the others who could assist him, about God and man. 
he must not think of himself as a partial power that needs only contribute. Rather, each must answer and be responsible for the whole. And one thing more, and this is again nothing other than an expression of the mystery of Shiflut, not to help out of pity, that is, out of a sharp, quick pain, which one wishes to expel, but out of love, that is, out of living with the other. He who pities does not live with the suffering of the sufferer. He does not bear it in his heart as one bears the life of a tree, with all its drinking in and shooting forth and with the dream of its roots and the craving of its trunk and the thousand journeys of its branches, or as one bears the life of an animal with all its gliding, stretching and grasping and all the joy of its sinews and its joints and the dull tension of its brain, he does not bear in his heart this special essence, the suffering of the other. Rather, he receives from the most external features of this suffering a sharp, quick pain, unbridgingly dissimilar to the original pain of the sufferer, and it is thus that he is moved. But the helper must live with the other, and only help that arises out of living with the other can stand before the eyes of God. Thus it is told of one Zadik that when a poor person had excited his pity, he provided first for all his pressing need, but then when he looked inward, and perceived that the wound of pity was healed, he plunged with great, restful, and devoted love into the life and needs of the other, took hold of them as if they were his own life and needs, and began in reality to help. He who lives with others in this way realizes with his deed the truth that all souls are one, for each is a spark from the primordial soul, and the whole of the primordial soul is in each. Thus lives the humble man, who is the loving man and the helper, mixing with all and untouched by all, devoted to the multitude and collected in his uniqueness, fulfilling on the rocky summits of solitude the bond with the infinite, and in the valley of life the bond with the earthly, flowering out of deep devotion, and withdrawn from all desire of the desiring, he knows that all is in God and greets his messengers as trusted friends. He has no fear of the before and the after, of the above and the below, of this world and the world to come. He is at home and never can be cast out. The earth cannot help but be his cradle, and heaven cannot help but be his mirror and his echo.' 